So let's kick it off. It means um, you'll get the show on the road. Um, well, welcome you. back <laughs> in, a, in a bigger circle. And I really hope that you enjoyed um, the, the entire experience that you made new friends, um, built on the strengths of existing friendship, or, but, but most of all that you that you could good feedback and, and truly intelligent people change their mind in light of new data. Um, so I hope in that light you, you have been incredibly intelligent over the last hours. Um, this, this last session will, will, will summarize and, and in particular will help us to look forward. So I'm totally delighted uh, to have our distinguished panel here, which is a healthy mix of um, incredibly intelligent individuals who are now uh, not so much on the academic side, maybe with one exception, um, but, but conquer also the professional life. And, and often the question is sort of what happens post PhD and the question is what's sort of the light at the end of the tunnel. And, and we see a lot of sticks, uh, but where's the carrot? So I've got three carrots for you here. Um, I, I, I like to introduce um, our panelists very briefly and then throw the ball at them so they can do the introductions. Um, but it gives me absolute pleasure to, well, first of all, welcome back um, because we've seen you at uh, our previous colloquium. Um, Cara again, um, and um, Dr. Cara Burns uh, has worn multiple hats, but more recently has joined the University of Melbourne, uh, right now from here, but very soon uh, in Melbourne, of course, and continue your, your kind of highly innovative um, journey and, and helps now with a focus on health, of course, the University of Melbourne to, to commercialize and, and, and take typical innovation methods into the world of, of, of research. And maybe you can talk about what you do there Oh, maybe I throw it to you at right now. Can you kind of give a one minute summary of what do you actually do there? Thank you, Michael. So um, my name is Dr. Cara Burns. I did my PhD in the QUT Business School and I looked at patient generated health data and patient engagement. Um, and I ran a clinical trial, but all my work was published in a combination of health and business. So um, unbelievably, I've been hired by the Centre for Digital Transformation in Health. It is I, a business inside a centre, inside a medical school, inside a university. And my role is um, I'm going to be a program manager that looks at incubating ideas that come to us um, around digital health products. And I really, my role will be setting up a framework so that we can pick the ones that we think are going to be most successful and that are going to have the most impact for patients out there in the world. So um, from that, we'll find our partners. We'll find people who we can, um, you know, apply for, you know, million dollar grants with, and then build actual products within our centre. Thank you. Welcome back on stage. Um, show of politeness. Um, Fahami. Fahami is well known to many of you. Fahami has been for many years here. Um, Fahami, you've done a, an outstanding PhD. You know, information systems school have have kind of gained a lot of experience as a sort of postdoctoral fellow more, more recently, uh, and I'm, I'm delighted and honored to have worked with you on this. You, you worked in the area of trust, uh, demonstrated agility, and, and very soon were presented at one of the top conferences, um, this sort of research. Uh, but, but during all of this, you also then decided to, to move into a very different area, and then we moved from one of the best universities in the country to one of the best consulting houses in the world. So, so you joined Deloitte. You want to give us a quick update on what do you do at Deloitte right now? Well, um, so I just give a little bit of explanation of what, I mean, most of you really know what is, who is at Deloitte and what they do. So this is mostly consultancy and they work with uh, big clients and uh, I work in Deloitte Digital, basically focusing on anything that related to uh, digital transformation and anything that bringing new systems like focus on e-commerce, focus on uh, bringing new technologies to uh, for new processes. So it's really focused on technology and business together, which really matched my background, which comes from IS school. And uh, so I think it's very relevant. I, I bring lots of my experience from what I have done at the university. Actually, it's a good thing to see that. But what we, I do there is, um, Basically, we look to the, what a business needs to do those transformation, what are the requirements and providing the journey for a business, what they should do, what are the um, technologies that they should acquire. And uh, sometimes it goes to the bit of detail as well, like 
what is exactly the name of the technology and how it's going to uh, satisfy the, the business requirement. Um, so that's, a, that's what I'm explaining, honestly, is a project that I'm working on it right now. So I should say my experience, I've been there only one month. So there is a spectrum of projects happening, obviously, there. And there are all different levels of uh, abstraction. The one that I'm working on is quite high level, coming up mostly with the capabilities, with uh, the roadmap for digital transformation rather than um, like more details. But I know that there are other projects happening that they cover more uh, detail on technology development as well. Thank, thanks, Sahami, and welcome back. And last but not least, we move from a, a large consulting house to, to the largest insurance company uh, in the city. Second so, largest, so sadly. Second, I'm sorry. Yeah, I've got my statistics. We'll be we'll be first soon. Um, but the wannabe <laughs> biggest insurance company. Um, so uh, welcome to uh, Doctor Doctor Christoph uh, Nisa. Um, um, Christoph, you have done a lot of work uh, here, but we're more interested in what you're doing right now and and how the past, uh, in particular your PhD, has helped you doing what you do right now. And and today started with a focus on on agile delivery when we listened to MIT, and I think you're also in that space of agile delivery. So mm. give us a bit of a summary. What what do you do right now at some Sure thing, yeah. Well, um, like for Hame, I'm a, I'm a fresh corporate jumper. So I've only been there for about eight months, um, although that's gone very quickly. So um, what I do at Suncorp um, is I'm an agile delivery lead. So basically it's working with the different squads in our department to make sure that they're working as agile as possible. And of course that's often tough because you're dealing with people above you, people on your squads, and then people within your departments as well. And we're all B2B, we're not really B2C. So it's a little bit tough sometimes, but um, I'm responsible for making sure that that's all running in an agile way. We're removing blockers, or we're supporting the teams that are there. And for context, our department's automation delivery. So we're all looking at um, how we can take things which exist in the Suncorp environment, be that banking, policy, direct distribution, anything. Um, and we're responsible for throwing automation opportunities back to the business and saying, can you qualify this? And they say, yeah, sure, go ahead or throw it in the bin. Or they'll come to us and say, can you automate X, Y, Z? We think it's gonna save 10 full-time equivalent loads and it's gonna save the company half a million. Well, we hope it's saving the company half a million, um, but that's basically what we do. Yeah. So Christoph, what was the title of your PhD? Oh, I don't remember. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I, can, I can give you the short of it, which is um, I was looking at how older adults adapt to different workplace environments in non-standard employment. So given COVID and people working from home, what are the different systems they're using? How are they adapting to those? Um, what strategies are they doing to adapt to those? So it's very much um, user behavior. Okay, and, and did this PhD somewhat help you in the work you do right now? Do you want me to be tactful or honest? Now honest. No. And was, it, was, it, was it counterproductive? Like No, it wasn't counterproductive. I would just argue that the journey that a PhD student takes is filled with um, transferable skills. And I would probably argue that the transferable skills that I developed during my time here at QT and during the time that I was doing my PhD would have transferred. Yeah. I would say that, you know, um, an executive manager, manager isn't going to tap me on the shoulder and say, tell me about how older people yeah. are transferring into workplace systems. Um, that's probably the last thing on their mm -hmm. mind. But I would say that the other bits and pieces um, are probably, yeah, very transferable. Yeah. Um, because that's like something we'd like to explore. Sometimes you have a PhD, we create a piece of IP and become an entrepreneur, uh, or we, we work for a large corporate can use it. Uh, but sometimes it's, it's um, diligence. I know that companies like SAP, one of the largest software houses in the world, they would hire people with a PhD in, in astrophysics saying, hey, if you understand astrophysics, you probably also understand accounting. Um, so um, maybe, maybe Fahami, um, tell us a bit, like, uh, not just a PhD, but all, the whole postdoctoral experience. And I know it's only one month into the experience, but, but do you think it, it gives you a net benefit? Or what are the sort of transferable skills, whether they're really truly intellectual or additional skills that, that help you at Deloitte? Um, I think one of that, like if you talk about transferable skills is uh, problem solving. I think it's one of the things that you learn because um, doing PhD and also research is always like you have this problem and you have the whole world to look for it, answer, right? You don't have much of, you don't, you have no way to narrow it down from the start. And I guess um, Michael is somehow familiar with this uh, <laughs> problem solving uh, situation, but yeah, I think when you are there and you understand, okay, now you have those skills of um, problem solving, so you can structure things a little bit uh, easier, so you can link the concepts to each other, which I think for me is definitely being able to understand the link between concepts. Part of my job right now is like 
going through like lots of uh, requirements and lots of uh, or like documents that are already there and you need to identify what are the highlights of them so it's quite close to uh, to what we did as research i think um, before i go to Kara, question for you for Hami and, and christoph um how many colleagues have you met at your lawyer son who have a phd um and, and what are the reactions of your colleagues when, for whatever reason, they, they find out that you have a PhD? Do you think that, that increases the, the respect or do they think you're, you're overly qualified? And again, be, be, on, be honest. I just try to work out what's sort of the net impact you go first. in terms of reputational uh, um, or credibility related aspects. Um, for when they hear PhD, for them it's like a strange concept. So, like I'm talking about people that they are on my level, right? So they, for them it's a strange, like they were like, they're surprised, amazed as well, and sort of get distance a little bit. That's my first impression. So they like, mm, okay, you're a PhD. So they don't talk about it further. They don't really ask more questions. A few would, like I think I, one person actually asked me about my thesis. But the rest quite get distance. But on higher level, like so, I met a few people like as Deloitte partners uh, and talk with them. They really appreciate it. Um, they um, even try to link your experience that you are going to expect with your prospective experience at Deloitte that you are going through there to your PhD experience. And no, they were quite um, they were appreciating. I should say, yeah. On a level. Have you met anyone who has a PhD at Deloitte? Yes, actually, I met someone very randomly on the lift. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, we'll talk about it in the lift. Uh, and what about you and Suncorp? I'll say two things. Um, the first one is no one cares. It's, oh, you have a PhD? Great, go back to work. Yep. No one cares. It's, it's the wrong area entirely. But I want to qualify that with context because context is king. So I would say that if you're in a role which hybridizes some level of research with corporate strategy or innovation or something, then the tone changes considerably. So for us, we're just about software delivery. So you have a PhD, great. Is that gonna help the software delivery? Probably not, just get on with it. Whereas I would argue that if you're in a department which is looking at say customer research strategy and you actually have to go out and you know, harvest that data or take the data that's existent, and um, spit it out in a manner in which highlights the uh, inefficiencies of your corporate business. And you can take that and say, look, this is an issue. Mm -hmm. Then I think if you're applying for that job and you have a PhD, that's a very different story. Yep. So I think context is king. So those two things, I would say. Have you met anyone? That's Absolutely no one. It's just me. <laughs> so people point me out, they're like, there's that guy. <laughs> that's about it. Um, Kara, it's slightly different with you because you, you continue to work in an academic environment, but probably in an dare I say, non-academic role? Um, so I, I'm only new to my role. I've only been in it two months. And before that, I was working in government and I didn't use the doctor title because mm -hmm. I felt that the PhD wasn't actually mm -hmm. helping me. Um, I felt that for, for working in government, it was actually a bit of an inhibitor unless you're at the context, mm, you're yeah. working in the data science team yeah. or you're working in a research team, then it actually mattered. Mm. So I, um, I didn't meet many people who had PhDs. When I worked in eHealth, there was one other and everyone said, he's the slow guy. <laughs> <laughs> that does not surprise me. Yeah. 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 He thinks about things forever. <laughs> but, um, but now, interestingly, so I work in the Centre for Digital Transformation of Health. The minimum requirement is a PhD. We all have them, but we're, we're a startup. We're trying to create a business. And we've had lots of robust discussions around, is a PhD the right entry requirement? And we yeah. would say, mm -hmm. probably not. What was the title of your PhD again? Uh, patient Generated Health Data and Patient Engagement. So in, Engagement, Empowerment and Patient Generated Health Data. And, and does, does the insight that you gained, does the sheer intellectual insight help you in your day-to-day -day work at Melbourne? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I think we you've touched a bit on it with problem solving. Being at, able to problem solve but also work in ambiguity really helps. So we're in an environment where there are lots of stakeholders with li lots of different ideas of what we're trying to create. I'm working on a brain cancer support platform or a brain cancer survivorship platform. We're building a digital platform. We've got three major stakeholders. And so a lot of the work is under being able to sit in the ambiguity, not have the answers, but being able to draw it out between the stakeholders. And so that's definitely the ambiguity part is what I learned my PhD. 
the thing that we're finding really interesting is how do we bring our academic rigor, not be too slow, but still apply it as we're developing technology, which can happen in a matter of weeks. Mm. And so that's interesting because we're able to think about creating new methods to rapidly translate information. And that, that's, that's really exciting. Good, that sounds very good. Um, I, I throw it back to the audience uh, because your questions matter much more than my questions. Um, yes, so you go for it and then Jennifer. <laughs> yeah, so um, when I worked in eHealth, um, that's a predominantly a technical organisation. So think poles, wires, Wi-Fi, yeah. yeah. Uh, I worked in the innovation team, the digital innovation team, and there was only five of us. But um, yeah, so the doctor wasn't very well appreciated. In fact, having even thinking about an evidence base, knowing that there is literature out there was a challenge. Working in um, the healthcare, so I worked at Metro North, I was in an admi uh, like an executive administrative environment. And so it, it, you know, people didn't really appreciate it, but the people I worked with had really high skills. And in the planning team that I was with, it was like they did a PhD when they put a plan together to create whole new hospitals, a whole new system. So, I, you know, I, even if they didn't have the title, I think they were doing the work. On the startup inside the university, it's a very well-funded startup from Melbourne Uni. They have millions of dollars to make it right because they want to get digital health and digital transformation right. So it's it's bigger than Ben Hur. There's like four pillars, um, you know. There's an education pillar, there's an informatics pillar, there's a validatron pillar where we're going to create digital phenotypes that test digital health products, and then there's an incubator underneath, which is what I'm doing. So uh, we've got a five-year runway, but we have already got three $1 million grants, so we're, we're on our way. Let's watch this space. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the, to the panel. Um, I would like to ask you um, how easy was it um, to find a job after your PhD? Did it take you long? Did you get headhunted because you were a doctor? Um, or did it take you some time to find um, a job because um, industry said oh, you spent um, three years not working for industry and just did research and now want to re-enter industry? How was your journey? This is for all of us, yeah? Yep. Yeah. Oh, all right, I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll start off. Um, I think we living in a weird time. And what I mean by that is COVID. So I think what we're facing right now in the marketplace is the fact that there's not enough skilled workers out there. We've been, sorry, just for our, my context and our, in Suncorp group, I would say our department has been aggressively recruiting. And even then we can't necessarily find the right people. So I would say that the jump from research to corporate, or I should probably say academia to corporate is always a notoriously difficult jump with a wide chasm and not everyone necessarily reaches the other side. Um, I would say it probably depends on two things. I would say it depends on how strategic you were in your PhD about where you wanna go and making sure that you have oh, everything you have in, everything you need to get there. So even if it's an internship in a company or you've got working experience in the past, um, you know, that's good. If you've got nothing, that's tough. Um, for me, it, it probably wasn't too bad because I had no scholarship for my PhD. I was working the whole time. Um, I was fortunate enough to be lecturing here as well at the same time and running a unit at Kelvin Grove. Um, but yeah, that jump normally is pretty tough to take. So I would say, um, did I get headhunted because I had a PhD? Absolutely not. Um, I would say for me, I actually had a friend who worked in Suncorp and he tapped me on the back and he said, hey, this came across my desk. I think you can do it. And I looked at it and said, yeah, I think so. The rest is history. So that's my side, but yeah, go ahead. Um, go for it, uh, Fahami maybe. Yeah. Um... I agree with Christoph that the market is now is really open and they are looking for uh, skills all over the place and Deloitte is hiring all the time as well. Um, so that's why I think 
also I think that's when I applied, like I applied not seriously really when I applied for Deloitte. And um, I, had a, I had developed my resume through the years, really. Like that's the important thing that you are able to write a CV that is your skills are readable in an industry lens, yeah. uh, not a PhD lens, not a research lens. So you need to have a CV that um, shows your skills that they want. So that's the important part. But uh, when I got the, I, have, I sent my CV only and then they called me and it was just like maybe the whole process took two weeks. So that was the easy, um, and I applied, there was no head funding, but I think that was quite easy but it also uh, reflects the market situation right now um yeah that's my point there Thank you. Cara? yeah it was a bit harder for me when i graduated in 2017 i kind of had five little jobs here at qut which i tried to sandwich together into one kind of role and in the end um i just needed something and it was someone who used to work here um that got me the job that i had with e-health or at least told me about it so that i was aware any further questions? Um, I was just wondering if your, um, I guess your intention as you were going through your PhD was actually to end up in industry or if, because it sounds like a lot of you got jobs, like you were saying, you didn't intend to, th you didn't think you were going to get the job at Deloitte and your friends gave you jobs. So I was just wondering if that was your intention or if your intention was to stay in academia, but then you've kind of fallen into industry. Yeah. All right, okay. I'll go first again. Um, I had every intention to stay in academia, actually, surprisingly. Um, I wanted to bugger off and do a postdoc in Japan and then COVID, uh -huh, uh, a lot of fun. Um, so that, that, didn't, that didn't really happen. And then I was looking at opportunities here. There was nothing here. Um, I feel like the university sector got hit pretty hard with COVID, you know, lack of international students. I don't need to preach to the choir here about that. Um, so I think that was pretty tough. There weren't any opportunities here. Um, and I know I did mention before um, that, you know, a friend did tap me on the shoulder, but I was looking at the same time as well. So it just happened to pass that the one that he put across for me, I applied for. And mind you, it wasn't a, oh, I know this guy. So it was an easier in. I still had to go blind. Um, and the department that he worked for was completely separate. So the only difference I had from any other candidate was that I had an internal job listing going through rather than a seek job listing. But at the end of the day, they're all still, you know, looked at the same. Um, do I regret my decision or anything like that? No, I don't think so. I think you just got to take the opportunities that are there. So yeah, I had every intention to stay in academia, but that's not what, what transpired. Yeah. So I didn't think I'd end up in academia. And I am in academia, so that surprised me. <laughs> I didn't do my undergrad in business, and then I had a PhD in business, so I couldn't get a job in a business school. And I there was no, and I was this cross-disciplinary person. And before COVID, digital health wasn't really a thing. Um, so it's just now there's a lot more opportunities. And the job I've got is like a combination of consumer engagement, digital health. Um, and research and so few people had that combination um, yeah. that I was just really lucky to get the role. That's what they were looking for. Uh, so I think my journey is a little bit, um, so I, I finished my PhD 2017, so it's quite a while that I finished my PhD. And I think I have gone through different stages of what I want since then. Um, so first when I finished my PhD, I, I, because my, my PhD thesis was very, philosophical, I would say it wasn't. And um, at that time, I really had this sort of, uh, I wanted to experience industry. So I started applying, but I wasn't successful at that point. Um, and then I started working at QUT. I was uh, an associate lecturer for a couple of years, for three years. And um, I, I got interested in academia and staying, and especially the research is very attractive to me. Uh, but also the uh, market is quite competitive. So yeah, I didn't think that I can secure a job and uh, in academia, and then I started again to look back to the industry. But I always wanted to experience the industry work because uh, that was missing in my experience. Thank you to the lovely panel. Um, for your insight so far. I wanted to ask, um, what are some of the concerns that you had 
or pressures that you were experiencing during your PhD that now with hindsight, you realize A, we're not a big deal, B, you didn't need to worry about or, or something else like that. And that can be pressures or things that were in your head that you were worried about or that other people were saying, oh God, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. That in hindsight, you're like, no, I didn't, I didn't need to do any of that. <laughs> you know, that's not, that wasn't my experience. I'm curious about, <laughs> about things like that. I'm going to get shot for saying this. <laughs> Probably hung, drawn and quartered as well. Publications, publications, publications. And I can only say from my perspective now, because right now my publications mean diddly squat, because is my manager going to read them? No, they don't care. They All they care about is whether or not, you know, I'm, I'm delivering on, on that side of things. Um, other pressures though, you know, half joking aside, other pressures though, I would say, I think I was quite fortunate. I don't think I really had too many pressures. I think one would be financial, which, <laughs> right, we're all here. Um, I know it's tough with the financial side of things. So I think you just got to be savvy and, and, and swallow the swallow the bullet a little bit and then once you're out then you can start you know getting on your feet there from the financial side of things but that's more a health and well-being side of things which is which is very important especially i know i know how stressful it is you know we're all on the same journey so uh, just at different stages so that, that's a bit of a tough one so um yeah aside from that though no i think i was quite lucky um i can't really speak to too many more things that i really suffered from aside from the the everyday kind of stuff so i'll pass along so at the end of the PhD, I did think, oh, I'm going to go around the world and show all my research and everyone's going to love it. I'm going to make connections and I'm going to get a postdoc. And it, I did. I went to Asia, I went to US and I went to America. And I was so tired at the end of the PhD that I didn't even really have the drive to kind of make the connections. So I kind of wish I had waited a little while to kind of do the conference circuit thing just and really be clear about who I wanted to connect with and why, rather than just thinking that it would happen. Uh, I think um, PhD is a very tough journey, really. Like, I don't think anything comes close to my experience, really. Uh, so whatever you experience is like, the rest of it is gonna be much easier compared to, for me at least, from my experience, P my PhD was, um, maybe a combination of many things in life, but you, I think it, uh, it was a tough journey. Uh, but I don't think that, like, I don't think I regret, like, I, I like my publication. I think if, I mean, uh, I don't know, if no one cares, I don't care if no one cares, I still like them. And I wish I, I wish I had done more publication because it's my name on it and it's, it's my thing. So yeah, that's something that I actually, I enjoyed and still thinking about it, yeah. So, so maybe just some crowd voting. I think there's, there's three types of PhDs. There is sort of the, the entrepreneurial PhD. You do your PhD to invent something. And I think the medical field, we have this a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, where people do a certain PhD and then, then they, they literally monetize the content. Then there, there's a kind of classical approach where the PhD is just like an apprenticeship. You learn science. You want to become an academic and you're really good on the scientific training and the content is just a case study. Uh, and the third one is sort of this is once in a lifetime experience prepares me for whatever I can do a PhD only once in my life and whatever happens happens then and I might start working for Suncorp or Deloitte. Can I ask who's in that first category here in the audience who thinks I will commercialize my PhD what I do here is so amazing that under the umbrella of a large company or on my own, I will be able to monetize my content. Diana, Nicola. Second category is sort of, this is just training. Yeah? I, I want to become a world leading academic. And what I learn here is the, the, the tricks and tools of science. And once my PhD is finished, I work on whatever, but I have become a great scientist. Uh, and, and who's in that sort of third category that says, well, this is just an experience and then whatever happens, happens after that. That's a good mix in the audience. Yeah, very good, very good. All right, I've got five or six more minutes left. Um, further questions, please. Do you, can you read it out? Uh, sorry. Ah, uh, Mezar. Ah, yeah, hi. Good to see you. And please. Hi, 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 Michael. Hi, everybody. Thank you, organizers. Do you hear me? Yes, yeah. loud and clear. Okay. I just want to ask you, ask a question. Yeah, go for it. From all of you uh, about the role of networks. Uh, you developed during your PhD in uh, finding your job. How was 
the role of contacts and networks you made during your PhD. Yeah, all right, maybe I'll take them. Just to make sure I've heard it correctly, that was, um, what was the role of networks to uh, during your PhD to help you find a job, correct? Yeah, everyone's nodding, all right. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question, much appreciated. Um, for me, I think networks are always important no matter what you do, that's just, you know, I, common sense, I guess, but um, the networks that I created in my PhD, while still valuable, and I'm utilizing them right now, I would say weren't very useful for me in getting my job because it was through someone else entirely. So I'll be the anomaly there and just say, for me, it wasn't helpful because I'm not in academia anymore, but that, that's just me. Uh, I know that's probably not helpful, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pass on to my uh, colleagues. Yeah, my first job really after the PhD at eHealth was because I knew somebody and I'd actually helped them get their job by looking at their resume and supporting them and coaching them. And then they said, oh, there's a job going in that would suit you in our department. So would you like to help? So networking is essential and networking where there's like, um, you know, that you you both support each other and you create a community, I think is really important. Uh, so for me, I well, after my PhD, I had academic jobs, so definitely the network was important there. But for the job I currently have, no, as I said, it was I just applied very conventionally, and yeah, I didn't know anyone there. So across the country, there's a big discussion around HDR internships, um, and then they're financially incentivized for, for, for all involved parties. Um, the PhD sometimes is like a waterfall model. We finish a PhD and then we start searching while the internship model is sort of create exactly those networks. Um, from the panel, what's your view on a, on a PhD student who would spend three months in a company, but not necessarily kind of collect data for their studies, but it's just pure, I'm here to help you and take time out and do an internship for three months. Would you do this? Would yeah, you see benefits? Definitely. I think it's great just to think about how you'd apply your skills in a context that isn't your PhD. Mm. And you can make those links earlier. Yep. And I think it's just confidence. You, you know, you've been in a kind of tunnel for, you know, three and a half, four years, sometimes longer, sometimes less. And so it just gets you out there to remind you what the real world is like or what work environment is like. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely some, I, I would love to have that app because as I said, I wanted always to have that experience and it gives you lots of confidence because you don't know that you know. And when you get there and you realize that, yeah, you actually know a lot. So that's that's very important. And then you learn how they work. And yeah, that's that would be awesome. And in your role at Suncorp, could you imagine that you literally hire a QT PhD students for three months to help you? <laughs> that would certainly be an interesting one. Um, but in terms of your initial question about whether or not mm -hmm. I think it's valuable, I think um, the qualifier is yes, especially if you're wanting to go into industry. Mm -hmm. yep. I would say, though, to be honest, Probably not if you're not planning on going to industry. Yep. If you have that academic mindset and you, you've got a lecturing role, it's there, you've got it. Or you've got a postdoc role, you've got it. And that's what you want to do. You have no interest in industry, less so. But yeah, if you're going to go down the industry route, 100%. And the second question, would you hire a PhD from... Well, I'm not responsible for hiring, so if you... uh, we're good there. No, no. <laughs> um, no uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's all about what skills do they have that they yep. can demonstrate. So yeah, I would say if that's there and they can deliver, that's the important yeah. thing. So, so treat this as like an industry sabbatical. If any one of you is interested, let, sorry, Gemma, I throw it at you. Uh, let, let Gemma know, uh, and we will facilitate this for you, yeah? Mm -hmm. All right, so this brings us to the last 25 seconds of the panel conversation. Uh, any questions from anyone? If this is not the case, then on behalf of everybody who joins us online and in the room, uh, we are incredibly uh, grateful. Uh, that gave up your precious time. It's always wonderful to see our PhD alumna back on campus. So please join me in thanking um, Kara, Christoph, and Fahami. Um, a tiny but very symbolic and laugh-filled token of appreciation. Oh, I'm going to so, demolish those on the bus. Um, <laughs> sure. Thank you kindly. Thank you. A long bus ride, I guess. Oh yeah. Kara, Christoph, <laughs> Fahami, thank you so much from all of us. <laughs>